I don't have to tell you what units I measure in. It's two particles, the fundamental particles. And they repel each other inversely as the square of the distance due to electricity. And they attract each other inversely as the square of the distance due to gravitation. Question, what is the ratio of the gravitational force to the electrical force? And that is illustrated on the next slide. The ratio of the gravitational attraction to the electrical repulsion is given by a number with 42 digits and goes off here. It's all this is written very carefully out, so that's 42 digits. Now, therein lies a very deep mystery. Where could such a tremendous number come from? That means if you ever had a theory from which both of these things are to come, how could they come in such disproportion? From what equation has a solution which has, for one, two kinds of forces, an attraction and a repulsion, with that fantastic ratio? People have looked for such a large ratio in other places. They're looking for a large number. They hope, for example, that there's another large number. And if you want a large number, why not take the diameter of the universe to the diameter of a proton? Amazingly enough, it also is a number with 42 digits. And so an interesting proposal is made that this ratio depend is the same as the ratio of the size of the universe to the diameter of a proton. But the universe is expanding with time. And that would mean the gravitational constant is changing with time. And although that's a possibility, there's no evidence to indicate that it's in fact true. And there are several difficulties, where, I mean, partial indications that it doesn't, that the gravitational constant has not changed in that way. So this tremendous number remains a mystery. I must say, to finish uh, about the theory of gravitation, two more things. One is that Einstein had to modify the laws of gravitation in accordance to his principle, with his principles of relativity. The first was, one of the principles was that effects cannot occur instantaneously, while Einstein, Newton's theory said that the force was instantaneous. He has to modify Newton's laws. They have very small effects, these modifications. One of them is, all masses fall. Light has energy, and energy is equivalent to mass, so light should fall. And it should mean that light going near the sun is deflected. It is. And also, the force of gravitation is slightly modified in his theory, so that the law is slightly changed, very, very slightly, and it is just the right amount to account for the slight discrepancy that was found in the movement of Mercury. Finally, with the connection to the laws of physics on a small scale, we have found that the behavior of matter on a small scale obeys laws so different, very different than things on a large scale. And so the question is, well, does gravity, how does gravity look on a small scale? What is what is called the quantum theory of gravity? There is no quantum theory of gravity today. People have not succeeded completely in making a theory which is consistent with the uncertainty principles and the quantum mechanical principles. I'll discuss these principles in another lecture. Now, finally, you will say to me, yes, you told us what happens, but what is this gravity? Where does it come from, and what is it? Do you mean to tell me that the planet uh, looks at the sun, or sees how far it is, takes the inverse of the square of the distance, <laughs> and then decides to move in accordance with that law and move? In other words, although I've stated the ma ma mathematical law, I haven't given you no clue as to the mechanism. I will discuss the possibility of doing this in the next lecture, which is the relation of mathematics to physics. But finally, in this lecture, I would like to, to remark just at the end here to uh, emphasize some characteristics that the gravity has in common with the other laws that we have mentioned as we passed along. The first is that it's mathematical in its expression. The others are that way, too. We'll discuss that next time. Second, it's not exact. Einstein had to modify it. We know it isn't quite right yet because they have to put the quantum theory in. That's the same with all our other laws. They're not exact. There's always an edge of mystery. There's always a place that we have some fiddling around, do you? That, of course, is not a property, probably not a property. It may or may not be a property of nature, but it certainly is common with all the laws as we know them today. It may be only a lack of knowledge. But the most impressive fact is that gravity is simple. It is simple to state the principle completely and have no left have not left any vagueness for anybody to change the ideas about. It's simple and therefore it's beautiful. It's simple in its pattern. I don't mean it's simple in its action. 
The motions of the various planets and the perturbations of one on another can be quite complicated to work out. But to follow how all those stars in the globular cluster move is quite beyond our ability. It's complicated in its actions, but not in the basic pattern or the, the, the system underneath the whole thing, is that's a simple thing. That's common in all our laws. They all turn out to be simple things, although complex in their actual actions. Finally comes the universality of the gravitational law, the fact that it extends over such enormous distances. That Newton, in his mind, worrying about the solar system, was able to predict what would happen in an experiment of Cavendish, where Cavendish's little model of the solar system, the two balls attracting, has to be expanded 10 million, million times to become the solar system. And then, 10 million, million times expanded once again, and we find the galaxies attracting each other by exactly the same law. Nature uses only the longest threads to weave her patterns, so that each small piece of her, of her fabric reveals the organization of the entire tapestry. Thank you.